Let's go to the Lord and ask a blessing on the preaching of his word. Our great God, we do ask you as we come to the time in our service where your word is boldly proclaimed. God, we pray that you would bless our pastor as you have gifted him, Lord, and you have, Lord, that you've given him the abilities to rightly divide your word. God, we pray, Lord, that his study and his diligence would be blessed and that your word would be effectual in the lives of your people, and it would also be effectual to draw unbelievers to yourself, God, that you would grant true faith and repentance. Lord, we pray that you would once again help us to cast the cares of the world aside as we focus on you and on your word. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Take your seat, please, and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. Uh, I think many of you were suspicious that this day would ever come, but I am am excited uh, to begin a new series looking at the Gospel of Mark this morning. Now, rather than a a traditional uh, introductory sermon that would be perhaps heavy on historical background and biographical information and themes and those kinds of things, I want to approach the, the introduction to this gospel, I think, in a, in a, in, consistent with the tone that we see throughout the book of Mark. Mark doesn't give us here a lengthy preamble. He doesn't warm us up. He jumps right in with the declaration the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and boom, we're off and running. Our focus today will be just on to that first verse. But here's what I want to look at. I want to give a, a biographical look at the men behind the gospel. Now, we of course know that all Scripture is inspired by God. All Scripture is God-breathed. The Holy Spirit is ultimately the source, the authority of the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is the author of all Scripture, and yet he uses human authors. He uses the means of ordinary men. Some of them were extraordinary in their gifts, but some of them were quite ordinary. And and even their demeanors, their temperaments, their personalities, their culture kind of comes through. And so there's a reason in God's providence we have four Gospels, three of which are referred to, you've heard the term, synoptic Gospel, meaning they they follow along, they track along with each other, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then John is is of a little bit different flavor, but we have four different Gospel accounts. Not because God wanted to be redundant, but because we profit in studying the different perspectives, all infallibly inspired by the Spirit of God. The heading that you find in your Bible says, mine says, the gospel according to Mark. That's not an original title. That title itself is not inspired. However, it's accurate. We're going to see that Mark is, in fact, the author of the book. We want to know a little bit about this man because it will will help shape, I think, from an introductory standpoint, how we understand it, how we receive this gospel testimony. So we're going to look, first of all, the gospel of Mark. Secondly, there's another man behind the scenes, as it were, in Mark's gospel. Somebody we know well from the pages of Scripture. It's Peter. And so let's look at the gospel of Peter. The gospel of Mark and the gospel of Peter. And then we will begin to meditate upon what it means when Mark says this is the beginning of the gospel, not of Mark, not of Peter, but of Jesus Christ, the Son of God of God. So let's read together. I'm going to read through the verse, first eight verses here of Mark's gospel, but again, we're going, to, we're going to spend our time looking at this first verse, and then by way of that first verse, kind of expanding our, the scope of our look here at these men that are behind the gospel. Here is the word of God, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God. 
As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt about his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I, will have, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless the reading and the preaching of his word. Let's think about, first of all, the declaration here that this is the gospel of Mark. What does this mean? The un, it was undisputed in the ancient church that Mark was, in fact, the author of this gospel. We're introduced to Mark, also referred to as John, in the scriptures. We were first introduced to him in the book of Acts. And right at the point of transition, when the gospel begins to break loose out of Jerusalem, when by the providence of God, persecution had come upon Jerusalem and the saints were just flung out into the world outside of Jerusalem, just as Christ had both commanded and foretold. And, and we first read about Mark. Luke, in his account of the book of Acts, sort of just drops his name there initially in Acts chapter 11. And I'll show you those places in just a moment. But, but Mark appears on the scene, at least his name appears here at that transition point between the gospel being, in a sense, confined, and I'm going to use that word loosely, confined to Jerusalem. The gospel's never contained, right? But that's geographically, that's, that's the extent of its spread at that point. And in God's providence, John Mark appears on the scene as that gospel is transitioning into the Gentile world. That becomes important. Go, as the gospel begins to, begins to go into Gentile lands, Mark was not an apostle. Mark was not an apostle, which means he was not an eyewitness of the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He never once heard Jesus speak. He, he never once saw the miracles that Jesus did. He, he never witnessed him calming the waves or healing the blind or raising the dead or turning water into wine. So what could this man, John Mark, know? On what basis could he write such a book that we call the Gospel of Mark? I mean, in any of your other studies, you, you pick up a book and you read the biography of the author and you go, what does he know about this subject? I mean, if you pick up a book about astrophysics and you see that the author is David Shiflett, you might as well throw it away. It's not going to be worth anything. Or certainly not biology or chemistry. Just throw it away. I don't, I don't have to know anything about those, those subjects. What makes Mark a legitimate authority Humanly speaking, again, Holy Spirit's the author. But why Mark? Why John Mark? What could John Mark really know about this gospel of Jesus Christ that from the get-go, from the very first verse, he says this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, Mark, how do you know that? See, Mark had two primary sources. Mark was not an eyewitness, so he's not writing from his own experience. He's not writing what he heard and observed and witnessed. But he had two primary sources, one of them written and the other one alive. The written one was the Gospel of Matthew. Now, if you pick up and you read any modern commentary, you're probably going to read or usually read that Mark was the first Gospel written. Don't believe that. That's not true. That's a product of modern... Uh, Critical theory, not critical theory, uh, uh, scholastic thought, but not, it's not in keeping with the consensus of the ancient church in which Matthew was the first gospel written. But the other source was the apostles themselves, and one in particular we're going to see. 
Peter testifies in his second epistle that no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. As it was with Mark also, all Scripture is God-breathed, and here by Peter's testimony, there was no prophecy of Scripture, including the Gospel of Mark. That's the invention of a human mind but God carried them along. And we ought not to think in pagan ways that God sort of possessed a man or channeled him in such a way that Peter just or Mark just sat at his desk and all of a sudden his hands started moving and he didn't know what was going on. And God wrote, that's not how the Spirit worked in the writing of Holy Scripture. He worked through human minds. He worked through human capacities. Their abilities, even their personalities come through. And when we think about the Gospel of Mark, we're going to see the influence of Matthew upon his Gospel. We're going to see that. Uh, By the way, just as a, a, if this were a paper, you would see the footnote, you'd read that on the bottom, or you'd have to flip to the back of the book. I'm going to give you the footnote. There's a book that I would commend to you if you want a, a short, kind of accessible history of the Gospels. There's a book called Why Four Gospels? The history or the historical origins of the Gospels. It's by David Allen Black. It's less than 100 pages. I mean, it's accessible. Uh, I would commend it to you. And he does take the, the Matthean priority view, which I think is the right view. So let's take a brief look at, at John Mark's background. Because I think it's a fair question to ask why don't we just skip ahead? Why don't we just go to Matthew or skip ahead to John? Because those were the two who were eyewitnesses to the things of Christ. Why, why, do we, why would we spend our time studying Mark? Well, the short answer is I've already preached to Matthew several years ago. <laughs> Which would make it easy. I could read reruns, but no, I'm not going to do that. But why, why, why Mark? I think there's some unique things that Mark brings to us. There's a perspective that's helpful to us. Now let's start where the scriptures start in Acts chapter 11. Uh, you, you can turn there if you, if you want to. I'm just going to give you a very broad brief overview, so it might be easier just to listen, but you're welcome to to follow along if you'd like. In Acts chapter 11, persecution has scattered the church, and the gospel has gone as far as a city called Antioch. Now, Antioch was a wealthy Gentile city. It was a thoroughly Greek, Hellenistic city. There were some Jews there, certainly, and, and Luke Uh, shows us why later on that's a problem, but there were Jews there in Antioch, but the vast majority of of that population were just plain old Hellenistic pagans, just rank pagans, and the gospel came there and began to take root, so much so that word spread back to Jerusalem that y'all won't believe what's happening in Antioch. So the church in Jerusalem responded by sending Barnabas. We're introduced to, to the character named Barnabas the son of encouragement. Barnabas is is dispatched by the church of Jerusalem to go down to Antioch. Barnabas gets there and says, wow, this is amazing. I'm paraphrasing. But this is incredible. The Holy Spirit has been poured out, out upon them. And listen to Luke's testimony in Acts chapter 11. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And then having seen With his own eyes, the amazing work that God was doing in Antioch, Barnabas leaves there, goes to Tarsus to fetch, you know who, to get Saul, to bring the apostle to Antioch, to Gentiles no less, and to observe and see and and build upon the work that was already going there. Well then, prophets end up coming down from Jerusalem, and one of them in particular, a man named Agabus, this is all recorded for us in in Luke's account. And Agabus prophesies that there's going to be a a widespread famine, a great famine. And so the saints in Antioch, these Gentiles who've been saved, could have been ransomed out of darkness. They've now been, those who were once far off have been brought near, and now out of the grace and generosity overflowing in their hearts, they say, you know what we ought to do? We ought to take up a collection and send to the Jews in Jerusalem. And so the church dispatches Barnabas and Saul to go to Jerusalem with this offering and give this relief to the saints there in Jerusalem. Well, while they're there, just 
coincidentally, while they're there, Peter gets arrested. And you know the story, Peter's in jail in Acts chapter 12. He's chained between two guards. And the angel of the Lord opens the door to the jail, and Peter walks out. Even Peter's not quite grasping what's going on. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible kind of thing. And, and Peter, the way that Luke records it, it's, it's as if Peter's kind of in a stupor. And, and in Acts chapter 12, verse 11, when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Did you catch that? There's a prayer meeting going on at Mark's mama's house. Just so happens that Paul and Barnabas are there. Peter comes, and you know the story. It's, if, if we were to make a movie out of it, this, it would be comic. Because Peter knocks on the door. The church is praying. Oh, Lord, please let Peter out of jail. The door knocks. It's Peter. And the, and the, and the, the servant girl closes the door and says, it's got to be a ghost because we've got to get back to praying for Peter to get out. Mark was a witness to that. The church in Jerusalem was meeting in Mark's mother's house. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the things that Mark saw and heard? Can you imagine the sermons that were preached in his presence? Can you imagine the, 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 just the, the, the electricity in the air when the apostles were gathered and the early church was beginning and Mark was there? No doubt he would, have had, he would have heard the apostles preach and teach. Well, then later in Acts chapter 12, we're told that Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service. What service? Well, taking the offering. Okay, so now they come back to Antioch, and guess what? Mark tell, or Luke tells us they bring with them John, whose other name was Mark. We discover later that John Mark is actually the cousin, maybe nephew, of Barnabas. Well, then in Acts chapter 13, the church in Antioch, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit has told the church in Antioch through the resident prophets to send out, to set aside Paul and Barnabas to go on the, very, the world's very first intentional, orchestrated, planned missionary journey. And John Mark goes with them. Now, could you imagine this opportunity for a young man? Just in, in God's providence, the church has been meeting at your mother's house. You get to your, your uncle or your cousin is Barnabas. Barnabas is paired up with the infamous Saul of Tarsus, who's now Paul, trained at the feet of Gamaliel. And, and you're seeing with your own eyes this gospel go to the Gentile land, and then you get to accompany them. John Mark's uncle, Barnabas, or cousin, was universally adored as a godly man. I mean, he was known as the son of, of encouragement. And then here's Paul. Can you imagine the opportunity to travel and study under the Apostle Paul? And at one point during their journey, this is Paul's first missionary journey, they go to a place called Lystra. And Paul heals a man who was born a cripple. This man had never in his life walked. And Paul heals him. And when the pagan crowd at Lystra sees this man up and walking around, the whole town erupts in a fervor. They begin to shout out, calling Paul and Barnabas Zeus and Hermes. And the priest to Zeus gets ready to prepare a sacrifice to offer to the gods who are here, who healed this man. And Paul and Barnabas, you can imagine, are beside themselves. Men, we are, a, we are men of like passions, just as you are. We are not gods. Well, word of that comes to Jews who are down in Iconium and Antioch, and they end up coming to Lystra, they provoke a crowd. You remember what happens to Paul there? He gets stoned. They stone him to death, believe that he's dead, and leave him for dead outside of the city. 
John Mark's there for the whole thing. Not what he thought he signed up for, is it? But it was at this very point that trouble comes. Weaknesses are revealed. Character deficiencies exposed. And as we go ahead to Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas had returned from their first missionary journey. They'd given their report to the church at Antioch that sent them out. They go up to Jerusalem again, to the Jerusalem council, because there's a whole circumcision issue they have to deal with. They come back to Antioch, and Paul says to Barnabas, you know what? We need to go out and travel once again and, 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 and check on the churches that we planted. Because see, after Paul got stoned, you know what he did? He didn't go to the next town. He went right back into Lystra and started preaching again and actually established church, a church there and appointed elders before he left. And he said to Barnabas, we need to go back and check on the work. But here's the problem. Barnabas wanted to bring John Mark again. And Paul said, and I'm paraphrasing again, over my dead body. We're not doing that. Why, Paul? Why would you not want to bring him? Because he deserted us at Pamphylia. Well, if you go back and read carefully in the book of Acts, Pamphylia was the next stop after Lystra. John Mark bailed. He tapped out. He said, I'm done with this. And Paul said, I can't trust him. We're not taking him with us again. And it led to a sharp division between Paul and Barnabas. I mean, the son of encouragement and the mighty apostle split over this issue. Paul takes Silas, goes back to retrace his steps on the first missionary journey, and Barnabas takes uh, 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 John Mark. The whole thing I'm preaching today, right? Forgot that one. He takes John Mark and goes to Cyprus. That's not the end of the story for John Mark. It's not the end of the story for him. His first big opportunity in ministry, and John Mark's blown it. He couldn't take the heat. But praise be to God, his story doesn't end there. Barnabas had not given up on John Mark. Paul had not utterly, we're going to see, Paul had not utterly given up on him. It was a tactical, strategic decision by, by Paul. This, we just, we can't afford that liability to go with us. But John Mark's usefulness was not over as he continued to grow in the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. His progress became clear to men all around him, including Paul. So much so that in, when Paul wrote to the Colossian church, from prison in Rome, Paul says this, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. Paul had never been to Colossae himself. Paul didn't plant that church. And yet, such was his confidence now in Mark that he could write to a church that he didn't even know personally and say, if this brother comes, and I've already written to you about him, but if he comes, welcome him. He's one of us. He's a faithful man. In 1 Peter 5, Peter refers to Mark as a son. Not literally, not biologically or even adopted his, his son, but he's a son in the faith. In a similar way that Paul would refer to Timothy or Titus as son. And then, of course, famously in Paul's, quite literally, his dying words recorded for us in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4 when Paul has said, only Luke is with me, everyone has abandoned me. Not one has been faithful. But you know what? Send Mark. Send Mark to me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. In Paul's dying words, he summons Mark, recognizing that he has actually proved uniquely loyal even when many others had faltered permanently. Do you hear where this is going? Do you see, by the Spirit's power, by the grace of the gospel, why Mark's perspective is important to us? See, this is the gospel according to John Mark. This is the gospel for those who blow their best opportunities. This is the gospel for those who falter during persecution. This is the gospel for those whose weakness shows up when they don't want it to. This is the gospel for those who, by God's grace and power, get up again and learn how to persevere. 
This is John Mark's gospel. It's the gospel for those who need a second chance, another opportunity. But also said there's a man behind this gospel of Mark. It's the gospel of Peter. See, Mark had heard the preaching of the apostles. In fact, he would have had access to the very first written gospel, the gospel of Matthew. There was a scroll. It would have been a standard length scroll, probably 30 feet in length, and it was all rolled up. And in fact, he probably heard many sermons preached from the gospel of Matthew. Listening to the apostles, listening to other teachers. But of all the apostles, there was one eyewitness that stood above the rest, and it was Peter. Peter was the chief eyewitness from whom John Mark would draw some of the details in his gospel account. And when we read all the gospels and and we read the epistles, as I talk to other believers, that we, we all kind of have a, a near universal uh, phenomenon. We, we, Peter stands out to us, doesn't he? P- Peter is, is, of the apostles, the one that seems the most, I don't know, earthy, the most real. He's the one that we could relate to. The one that we, we, we you know what, I, I can identify with Peter. He was a leader among the 12, certainly, but, but most of us don't relate to, relate to Peter necessarily in that noble way, <laughs> but we relate to his uh, you know, frequent flare-ups of his foot and mouth syndrome. We, we, we relate to his uh, impulsiveness. We, we relate to his being the first to speak and then being the first one to be corrected by his Lord. And we see throughout the, the book the book of Mark, the gospel according to Mark, that it, that it bears a certain aroma. It bears a certain flavor of Peter as we read through the book. It's unmistakably feel, familiar to, to those who know Peter by, by way of the scriptures. In fact, just one example. The, in, the, in the Greek text, the word that's often translated immediately shows up in Mark's gospel 41 times by my count in 16 chapters. Doesn't that just remind you of Peter? Come on, immediately, immediately, immediately. Everything's urgent. Everything's now. And, and Mark has that, that pacing, that sense of urgency. And, and Peter, again, was an eyewitness from the very beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. He was a witness, as were all of his disciples, to the healings, to the teachings to the miracles, to, the, to the, the signs and wonders. I mean, Peter felt the fear in his own breast when he saw those waves growing and the winds howling in that little bitty boat, and he heard those winds howling against them. If you just turn over a few pages to Mark 4, look at, look at the, the account here that would have been confirmed by Peter's own eyewitness testimony. In chapter 4, verse 35, on that day when evening had come, He, this is Jesus, said to them, let's go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he he was, and the other boats were with them. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, sleep on the cushion little detail that nobody else, none of the other Gospels have. Jesus was on a cushion asleep. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. One of the things that we're going to see as we work through the, the gospel of Mark is, is Mark is eager to see us recognize Jesus as the Son of God. He is not a prophet. He is not merely a teacher or a guru or a religious guide. He is nothing less than the Son of God made flesh. And can you imagine Peter's own recollection 
now an older man and mentoring Mark and saying, let me tell you about that time. I can still feel that fear. I've not experienced fishermen. I've been on that lake many times. I had never seen a storm like that one. And in our unbelief, we went and rebuked it. And he just spoke and the whole thing quit. We didn't know what to think. This is the gospel of Peter. Peter was there when news came that John the Baptist had been killed by Herod. And by Peter's own testimony, he and the other disciples took that headless body of John the Baptist and had to go lay him in a tomb. Peter was there for that. And those are the things that you remember more than just with your eyes. Remember the smell. Remember the sounds. Remember that feeling of dread. Peter remembered all that. He was there when Jesus fed 5,000. He was there when they filled up 12 baskets full of leftover, one rebuke for every disciple. Who didn't believe? It's Peter, who joined Jesus out walking on the water, remember? And yet he sank under the weight of his own unbelief. And then Peter witnessed things that not all the disciples witnessed. He, James, and John uniquely witnessed the transfiguration, witnessed Jesus being transformed in, in full white splendor and glory right in front of their eyes, heard the very voice of God from heaven. Peter was an eyewitness to that. Peter was there many, many times when Jesus rebuked sharply the Pharisees and the rulers of the Jews for their hypocrisy and for laying extra burdens on the people of Israel. But he was also there the many times when Jesus spoke so tenderly, so gently, so kindly to the sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the blind, the lame, the beggars, those who had been cast out by the society. He heard with his own ears. Jesus repeated predictions of his own death. In fact, you know, it was Peter who protested most strenuously against such a thing. So much so that at one point, Jesus looked him in the eye and said, get behind me, Satan, and rebuked Peter. We're still not getting it. And it was Peter who boasted at the 11th hour that even if all the disciples were to betray him, even if they all ran away and fled, he and he alone would be faithful to the end. Can you imagine the bitterness of soul that Peter felt as he described years later his own betrayal? How's he, how he recounted that, you know what, right as that rooster crowed, I made eye contact with Jesus across the courtyard. And that gaze nearly killed me. That's what I had done. Because of my sinful fear and unbelief, I betrayed my Lord. Just as he said he would, and contrary to my own boastings to the contrary. And Mark simply records Peter's own testimony that he broke down and wept. That's understatement, isn't it? Can you imagine? That's the kind of bitterness that time doesn't take away. You still feel that. Years later. But like Mark, Peter's story doesn't end with betrayal and abandonment, does it? It doesn't end there. It's, it, it's no wonder to me, by the way, that Peter and Mark found kind of a kindred spirit. It, it, it's, it's, it's no wonder to me, humanly speaking, that they became friends. Like Mark, Peter's story takes a sharply different turn. If you turn over with me to John's Gospel, the very end of John's Gospel in, in the 21st chapter, 
Here we find the disciples had returned as Jesus commanded them. They're on the Sea of Galilee, and they're out fishing. They return to what they know. And just as day was breaking, just as the sunlight's coming up, they spot a figure on the beach. Got a fire going. And Peter, apparently the first to recognize him. Or actually, it's John. Verse 7 tells us the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, said to Peter, It's the Lord. And you remember what Peter does. Still classic Peter. Doesn't even take his outer garment off. Just jumps in. Not waiting for the boat to go to shore. I'm, 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 I'm going. And Jesus says, bring out some of the fish that you've caught. They cook those. Verse 15 tells us, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, see, last time they were all together like this, just just the, the 12, and Jesus is speaking to them. He's saying, I'm about to be crucified. And all of you are going to betray me. And now we have a recapitulation in a sense, a, a retelling of this or of the same scene, or a similar scene. And Jesus singles out Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And commentators have tied themselves up in knots unnecessarily, wondering what, what does he mean by, do you, love, you, do you love me more than these? And they've, they've wondered, does he mean more than the fish? Because that was Peter's livelihood and occupation before. Do you love me more than your previous life? That's not what he's asking. I think he's asking the question in the same frame that Peter answered a previous question about betrayal. Because Peter made the claim, I love you more than these. These other 11, they're kind of sketchy. They're kind of shady. They may not make it, but I will. And now Jesus looks at Peter and says, do you love me? Do you really love me more than these? Knowing what you now know about yourself, Knowing now what you, that, what you know about your own weakness, your own frailty, do, do you, are you willing to stick to your same story? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend to my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Here's where he gets it. Here's where the hook gets set. Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time. Peter recognizes the symmetry. It's three times. And the third time, it dawns on Peter. He was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You hear the humility now? Before, it's, yeah, absolutely, I do. Now Peter's saying, Lord, only you know. I don't even know myself well enough to answer the question Fully. Do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And John tells us parenthetically, this is said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. And Peter turned and saw the disciple whom he loved, this is John, following them. And the one also had leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When the, when the Peter saw him and said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what's that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread 
among the brothers if this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but it is my will that he remain until I come. Or if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things and who we know that his testimony is true. So here now, Peter, with the right kind of humble self-doubt. There's a kind of self-doubt that's not good, or a kind of doubt that's not in keeping with faith. But there's a right kind of self-suspicion. There's a right kind of self-suspicion that says, I don't have the strength in and of myself to do what you've called me to do. But I trust you. That's where Peter gets. And Jesus, in a way that might seem even bizarre to us, encourages Peter by saying, you know what, this time, you'll be crucified. Like, can you imagine having the Lord tell you, you're going to be crucified one of these days? And you go out and go, yes! But can you imagine what a balm, what an encouragement to Peter's soul? Next time I won't falter. Next time, by the power of God within me, by the grace of Christ, I won't fail. Such is the gospel of Peter. Peter knew the power of the resurrected Christ. Peter knew grace. Peter knew redemption, and, and, and he knew second and third and fourth and tenth chances in a way that only comes through trial, a way that only comes by testing, and frankly, a way that only comes by failure. This is the gospel of Peter. This is the gospel for braggarts who become betrayers. This is the gospel of the humiliated who are raised up Again, this is the gospel for the speak first and later regret it kind of man. This is the gospel of true and lasting life in Jesus Christ. But this is not ultimately Mark's gospel. This is not Peter's gospel. We go back to chapter 1. What does Mark say? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You have in your hands, and you will have in your hearing over the next months, don't ask me how many, but over the next months, the very testimony of men who understood the power of this gospel. As Brother Stephen mentioned to us in the call to worship, even the word gospel is used more in Mark's gospel than any others. This is central in Mark's thinking. This is central in Peter's thinking. Can you have any reason to think why they would be the case? They understood it. And see, they understood something important. The gospel is not an adjective to modify anything that we do. We don't put a hyphen after gospel and and tack it onto whatever we want and say, "This, this this makes it sound good. The gospel is not a lifestyle. The gospel is a proclamation of good news. This was, was, the word was, was actually borrowed from the, the Roman imperial concept when an, a Caesar or a general would, would return victorious in battle. There would be a gospel herald. There would be someone who proclaims, that announces that victory has been won. That an enemy has been defeated and that general would not come back empty-handed. Behind him in that procession would be all the spoils of his victory. Mark says this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who comes victorious, who comes triumphant. It is a proclamation, a declaration that the eternal Son of God took on. He assumed to himself our flesh, our humanity, and all the weaknesses thereof except for the sinful nature. And he offered himself as the perfect sacrifice. It is an announcement of nothing less than victory over sin and death. This is the gospel. 
of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is not the gospel of Jesus Christ, the best rabbi ever. It's not the gospel of Jesus, a teacher. It's not the gospel of Jesus, the best ethicist and moralist in the world. It is the gospel of the one who was crucified, dead, and buried, and raised from the grave. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the infinite, eternal, holy, omnipresent, omnipotent God who took upon himself our human flesh. Permanently and indissolubly joined together divinity and humanity, fully God, fully man, two natures, one person, the God-man, Jesus Christ, our one and only mediator between God and man. Do you know him? This is John Mark's gospel. It's Peter's gospel. Is it yours? Is it your gospel? Do you know the power of a life redeemed? Do you know the power of sin canceled? of a debt paid, of new life given to you. John Mark never met Jesus face to face. He he never witnessed his miracles, and yet he believed. Do you? Do you believe what the Scriptures record about our Savior? that he was born of a virgin. His father was the Holy Spirit. He did not inherit our sinful nature through Adam. He lived a perfect, sinless, spotless life and was crucified, not because of any wrong in him, because he identified with our sin and offered himself up to be the curse of the one who hangs on a tree in our stead. For John Mark and for Peter, they did not testify about this gospel in an academic way. They didn't proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in in a historical sense alone. Everything they testified was historically true, no doubt. But they testified to its power within them. In a sense, when John Mark, wrote, John Mark wrote the gospel, he offers himself up as exhibit A in a very similar way that Saul of Tarsus did. He says, look at me. I'm the chief of sinners. I was a violent persecutor of the church. I was an enemy of God. And look at what he did in me. This is the power of God. This is the power of the gospel unto salvation for all who believe, both Jew and Gentile. And John Mark and Peter, and I hope you can testify to the same thing. Can you join your voice with John Mark and with Peter in testifying of the power of Christ to redeem you, to cleanse you, to heal you, to make you useful for the service of the Lord Jesus Christ? See, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it's a gospel for sinful men. Amen. Let's pray together. God, our Father, we stand humbled by your mercy towards us. Father, I pray that any here today that have not yet believed this gospel, this declaration of victory over sin and death, that today, that today, Lord, by your mercy, that today would be the day of salvation, a day of of perhaps hearing with spiritual ears for the very first time. of believing that your word is true, that Christ really has come, that Jesus of Nazareth truly and indeed is the Christ, the Son 
of the true and living God. And by his perfect life, by his spotless, sinless sacrifice upon the cross, has made himself a ransom for all who by faith will take hold of him. Lord, will you be merciful to those who have yet to believe and cause them by your Spirit's power to believe this, to open their eyes, to see the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his glory and splendor and mercy and tenderness. And for others who perhaps have walked with Christ for years, will you grant to us a renewing of the joy of our salvation? Will you sanctify us according to the truth that he proclaimed, the truth that he gave to his disciples by your spirit to proclaim? Will you grant to us eager ears and willing hearts to follow him in humble and simple obedience? We ask this for our good and for the glory of your triune name. Amen.